we have the honor of giving a brief introduction of the chairperson of this session, Emeritus Professor Hevage. Professor Piyadasa Hevage is Emeritus Professor in Geography at University of Ruhuna, currently serving to the Department of Social Sciences in the Faculty of Management, Social Sciences and Humanities in General Sir John Kotlava Defense University as Senior Professor in Geography. Prior to that, spanning over four decades, he was a senior professor, head of the Department of Geography, and dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, University of Ruhuna. He completed his postgraduate diploma and master's in science in medical geography at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, University of London, UK. Professor Hevage obtained his PhD in geography from University of Ruhuna. He has more than 40 years of experience in teaching, research, and providing expertise consultant assistance and coordination in geography, medical geography, career guidance, reproductive health, contraceptive use, and in the practice of induced abortion. Professor Hevage has provided his service as a committee member to the Advisory Committee of the Central Environmental Authority of Sri Lanka, a visiting lecturer of University of Colombo, a resource person to National Institute of Education, an advisor to the Department of Examinations Sri Lanka, and reviewer for the Sri Lanka Journal of Social Sciences, National Science Foundation, and he is subject head for geography of the GCE Advanced Level Examination. Professor Hevage has gained a reputation among the academia, civil society, development partners, and the state sector as a change agent in geography and geography-related studies. Sir, we cordially invite you to commence the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, you all the second session of uh, social sciences under the theme of achieving resilience through digitalization, sustainability, and sectoral science for me. And in this afternoon, we have uh, five presentations to be done by authors, and we expect uh, we will start it soon. And uh, I just uh, would like to... Uh, give a brief description about this theme and how our research is related to this theme. Uh, the achieving resilience through digitalization, sustainability, and sectoral transformation. I believe uh, the key word of this theme may be the resilience, achieving resilience. And if you go to a simple definition on this, uh, term resilience, the, it is the meaning to understand the capacity to recover from difficulties. So I believe all our five research done for understanding how to recover from difficulties. And there, I think we can divide these difficulties into two groups. One is to uh, man-made difficulties. Uh, very clearly, we can find economic difficulties, social difficulties, political difficulties, psychological difficulties, and even medical uh, side difficulties. And on the other hand, we can also find out um, nature-made difficulties. Clearly, disasters are in this part, and also there are some other nature-based difficulties encountered by the human being, for example, heat and even cold. So how do we manage these difficulties? And that is our theme. And the next part of this uh, common theme is digitalization. Now how this is related to this uh, managing difficulties is a good point to answer. When we say digitalization, it doesn't mean uh, only the gadgets that we are using. I think uh, uh, in addition to these gadgets, the measurements 
or are also relevant to, the, the, to this uh, digitalization. Now, to what extent we are using digitalization in the field of uh, humanities, social sciences and management is a question to answer by uh, research. Now, for example, in the medical sciences, when we say digitalization, for example, a, a medical doctor may ask a patient to come up with a test. For example, complete blood count. What does it mean? Why it is necessary? For example, the complete blood count means it helps detect disorders such as infections, anemia, immune deficiency, and blood cancers. And with that, doctor will have an opinion even without looking at the face of the patient. He will see the report and make the decision. And he will make uh, prescriptions as well. So the normal individual contains, on average, 5 million red cells and 7,000 white cells per cubic millimeter. That's how uh, they apply digitalization. But can we do it in our areas as well? Management, social sciences, and humanities. And I think it is really, really difficult thing because we think that our variables, factors, determinants are not completely measurable. For example, what about the, the factor or the determinant if we take the true love? Can we measure it? Any, any measurable uh, way of doing it? For example, the wife wants to know how much her husband loves. Can we find it as percentage-wise value? And uh, the, the answer may be somewhat difficult. Sometimes people may say that number of bunches of flowers may be a factor or determinant, but there are many arguments. Or even can we do complete love count, like complete blood count? So this is a matter of concern for the researchers. And I think we can hear from these researchers how difficult for them to undertake research. So with that comment, I would like to invite uh, uh, our five presenters to start with the first presentation from uh, W. M. Fernand. The topic is the importance of social work as a practicing profession to enhance gender mainstreaming in sustainable development in Sri Lanka. And we invite to make your presentation. Yeah, and I think we will have to announce the conditions of the presentation as well. You will have 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 12 minutes, you will be given uh, one minute, uh, one bell bell ring and the 15 minutes you will be given the second bell ring. and there will be questions to be answered at the end of all presentations so uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, i stand before you today to discuss uh, about one of the most important topics in uh, the field of social work which means the importance of social work as a practicing profession to enhance gender mainstreaming in sustainable development of sri lanka so in the next uh, 12 minutes, I will be uh, discussing about the dynamics of gender equality and the role of social work, as well as the challenges faced by social workers and the path forward. In the past three decades, uh, Sri Lanka has achieved considerable economic growth, speaking of uh, maintaining an average annual per capita GDP rate of 4.4 uh, in the 1990s and 4.2 in the 2000s and 4.4 in the 2010s, despite the challenges faced uh, by the civil war. So uh, this economic progress uh, has translated into the advancement of human development, maintaining Sri Lanka as a high human development category, uh, which means ranked in the 72nd place out of 189 countries in the 2020 Human Development Index. So. Uh, uh, the gender mainstreaming as advocated by the UN Women has uh, been global strategy since the Fourth World Conference of Women in 1995. 
So the 2030 ag agenda for su sustainable development uh, underscores the importance of gender mainstreaming in achieving sustainable development and recognizes the essential role of the social work in addressing gender equalities and integrating gender perspectives into development policies as well as programs in Sri Lanka. So speaking of the research aim as well as the objectives of this study, the aim of this research is mainly to explore as well as to understand the role of social work in mainstreaming gender perspectives for achieving sustainable development goals in Sri Lanka. And uh, the research objectives are uh, to assess the current progress and challenges the Sri Lanka is facing and to analyze the role of social work in addressing gender inequalities and to explore the challenges faced by social workers and advocate for greater recognition of social workers' role uh, in gender responsive policy dialogues. So speaking of the methodology of this study, this is basically a secondary study, secondary qualitative study, uh, which conducted using various secondary data sources, uh, including academic, government, uh, international reports, as well as uh, the other uh, relevant documents to explore the topic. And the content analysis was the primary method of uh, data analysis is used. And the uh, ethical considerations and acknowledgement of potential limitations have been addressed within uh, with these secondary data available. And uh, the study emphasizes the significance of social work in promoting gender sensitive sustainable development despite the limited existing research conducted within this area because of uh, this collaboration in between uh, social work and the gender mainstreaming which is less spoken within the Sri Lankan context. So uh, speaking of the results obtained within this study, actually uh, the gender mainstreaming objective as a main um, uh, topic that we should have to talk about in here, it is a kind of a strategic method that is aimed at embedding gender perspectives and considerations into the every facet of development. So uh, it uh, transcends the treatment of gender as an isolated matter which strives to establish gender equality. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, gender equality as an uh, important factor in all endeavors related to policy formulation, research, advocacy, legislation, as well as program execution. So gender mainstreaming is very much important in achieving gender equality in a country. So guiding principles, uh, speaking of why this is mostly important for the uh, field of social work, the guiding principles of gender mainstreaming established by UNESCO, including recognition, diversity, intersection, uh, equality, equity, empowerment, and agency, participation and parity, partnership between women and men, and social justice. Uh, so mention all these uh, core principles align with the social work's core values also, which are mostly uh, spoken in uh, terms of promotion of human rights, addressing social inequalities, and striving for inclusive as well as equitable societies. So uh, speaking of the policies related to gender mainstreaming in Sri Lanka, uh, it has been uh, mentioned and recognized in several sectoral policies in Sri Lanka, acknowledging the importance of incorporating gender perspectives into the pro uh, promotion of uh, gender equality in the country. So uh, one of them is national human resources and employment policy. This recognizes gender mainstreaming in employment as well as promotes women's participation in the labor market and improve job opportunities. And the next one is the national policy framework for social integration. So this emphasizes gender perspectives as well as gender equality and uh, very much essential for fostering inclusivity and equitable practices in the respective sectors. So even though these much of policies has been implemented in the country, the, the adequate integrate, integration of gender mainstreaming into the profession of social work has been uh, less recognizable. So uh, let's uh, try to focus on what are those challenges faced by both social local social workers as well as uh, the uh, service users itself. So uh, according to the Sustainable Development Report in 2023, Sri Lanka has major challenges to remain gender equality, uh, which means uh, SDG 5, uh, since it's caused stagnating or increasing at less than 50% of the required rate. 
So speaking of SDG five indicators, uh, uh, the following. Uh, uh, speaking of the SDG five indicators, actually, uh, for an example, indicator three, which means the ratio of female to male labor force uh, participation rate, the country is facing major challenges with a decreasing norm score. As well as speaking of the indicator four, which mentions about the seats held by women in the national parliament, Sri Lanka is still facing major challenges with scores stagnating or increasing less than fifty percent of the required rate. And speaking of the indicator one, which means demand for family planning is satisfied by modern methods. This is uh, still the country is facing several challenges with scores stagnating or increasing at least that 50% of the required rate. And the indicator two mentioning about the indicator two, the ratio of female to male mean years of education received. Uh, actually, the country has achieved this SDG so far, which is a... a positive uh, thing happening in the country, but still on track or maintaining the SDG achievements. So speaking of the SDG five achievements in Sri Lanka, actually we were able to uh, get a good results of the ratio of female to male mean years of the education received, but the other indicators are still challengeable. So uh, speaking of the gender inequality in Sri Lanka, actually the one of the most uh, Crucial problems that the country is facing uh, is the economic participation. Because uh, the country, while Sri Lanka has achieved progress in various gender-related policies, the economic participation of women is still remains as a challenge, even though uh, we have a good literacy level of uh, Sri Lankan women. So uh, in 2019, only 31.2% of women were employed compared to uh, to 71.5 percentage of men. So this gap hampers women's empowerment and their potential contributors to the country's economic growth. And uh, speaking of the social norms, which is also one of the major factors that concerns when uh, females wanted to uh, get uh, actively participate in the labor force. Because uh, like uh, when it comes to the deeply ingrained social norms in the country, these governs women's roles in the family as well as in caregiving work. So these norms create significant barriers for both women and girls to seek, enter or advance in the labor market. So uh, to address these gender disparities in labor markets, it is important to integrate gender mainstreaming strategies into the Sri Lanka's development efforts. In doing so, still there are some issues faced by the local social workers because uh, this means actually considering the impact of uh, policies and programs on both men as well as on women. So actively, this is trying to work in, uh, in reduce gender inequalities. So even doing that, Sri Lanka social work is still facing problems because even though social work is now recognized as a profession in the country, still the recognition of the uh, certain profession is still in a low point. So uh, focusing on the challenges faced by these local social workers, the first one is the recognition and gender mainstreaming. So social work as a profession in Sri Lanka faces limited recognition, as I mentioned earlier. So additionally, the importance of gender mainstreaming within this profession is not widely acknowledged. So this lack of recognition kind of hindering the development of ethical codes tailored to gender equality considerations. So speaking of the next uh, issue that is facing Sri Lankan social workers, the next one is the field agency constraints, or let's say the limited support from the field agencies. So social work practitioners often encounter challenges in applying ethical principles due to the rules and regulations imposed by the field agencies. So because of this reason, this might limit their ability to uh, provide ethical services, especially with regard to the client confidentiality. So the next one is the service user empowerment. So uh, the next issue is the service user empowerment. Like the principle of self-determination is core aspect of the social work, but uh, in various settings such as children's homes, elder care facilities, and hospitals, uh, this service users' right to make their own choices is often violated. So this is particularly pertinent in the context of gender equality as well as empowerment. So the next issue is the cultural as well as religious factors. 
So the social workers in Sri Lanka may face ethical issues related to cultural and religious beliefs. For an example, if they are going to work with commercial sex workers and abortion and topics like reproductive health, they are facing uh, several issues because uh, including the LGBT rights, since uh, it's kind of challenging to address both uh, the Sri Lankan or the cultural aspects as the core and the core values of the Western social work perspectives. Because uh, when it comes to the Western uh, concept of social work, it is kind of different from Sri Lankan social work. So since we are still using the Western concepts within the country, that is the main problem of why we can't use uh, cultural context-based social work approaches or practices within Sri Lanka. So uh, it's like uh, the uh, social work as a practice profession. It is trying to tackle gender-based issues in development right now. And uh, concluding what I have said earlier, so uh, gender mainstream and social work are pivotal for achieving sustainable development and gender equality in Sri Lanka. Adhering to gender mainstreaming guiding principles can contribute to creating equitable and inclusive societies. While Sri Lanka recognizes gender mainstreaming in various policies, still challenges exist. So these include low female economic participation and high, uh, despite the high female literacy rates. So overcoming these hurdles required indigenizing social work education, which is very important, and developing an ethical code, promoting self-determination for service users, as well as addressing cultural and religious impacts and fostering partnerships. So such efforts alongside gender mainstreaming will advance gender equality and sustainable development of Sri Lanka. So uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much for your attention and I look forward for your questions and answers. Thank you very much. Uh... We will keep the questions to the end. Thank you. The first presenter, I think I should uh, give the details of the presenter. Uh, W.M. Fernando is a visiting lecturer, Faculty of Humanities at the Aquinas College of Higher Studies. And also he, she is a research assistant in the Department of Medical Humanities, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Columbia. And thank you very much for your presentation. We will uh, go to the second presentation. The topic is a literature survey on Facebook intrusion, predictors and effects. And it will be uh, presented by, in fact, it is a joint uh, paper, MPM Valleboda, SS Rodrigo, and C. Deduage. And the presenter will be S.S. Rodrigo. She's, uh, she or oh, he is from St. Xavier's College. Uh, from the, uh, yes, other two also. See, the Duage is from Ogilvik Digital. And MPM Valleboda is with us, uh, Manuri. And we are glad to hear from you. Uh, who will be taking the presentation? I'll be taking the presentation, right? Okay. I expect that the head table can hear me properly. Can you hear me, sir, ma'am? Yes. All right. Then let me start the presentation. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Myself, Samala Rodrigo, and I'm extremely elated to participate in 16th International Research Conference headed by General Sir John Kotalavala defense university so my research paper would be a literature survey on facebook intrusion predictors and effects so first of all let me unveil you the content of this presentation first of all i would like to give you a brief introduction about this uh, topic and then the significance of the study then the methodology then what we have unveiled through this uh, thorough investigation and uh, in the ultimate level the conclusion. All right, let me proceed with the introduction. First of all, I would like to draw your attention to something very important. According to the current statistics of uh, World Bank, World Bank has mentioned that the entire Earth population consists more than 7 billion of people at the moment. So among that 7 million of billion of people, 
2.99 billion of people are using Facebook at the moment. That means as a percentage, 37.2 percentage of people are using Facebook at the moment. So that means a considerable percentage. If I draw your attention to this particular graph, in that particular graph, it clearly explains you or clarifies you according to the statistics that Facebook is the world's largest social media platform that people are using at the moment. So it is really, really important to investigate about such a social media platform since most of the people are using Facebook at the moment. So we need to be aware of what is inside and we need to mitigate the problems which are available inside the social media uh, platform such as Facebook. So let me go ahead. So sim similar to our realistic world, we are experiencing the similar things in this virtual space as well. We can build our relationships, we can portray ourselves in Facebook, and we can get entertained, we can seek entertainment, we can sell our products, and we can promote our things, we can advertise our things. So similar to our realistic world, we can experience experiences lots of things inside this virtual society or virtual space as well. So uh, since Facebook is a wide great social media platform, it has drawn its concerns on these areas. It has raised a question about our privacy. And day by day, we are hearing stories about cyberbullying and about unethical incidents happening within the Facebook. So exposure to harmful contents. And people compare themselves with other personalities inside the Facebook. So uh, those are the concerns. So what is the significance? Why do we need such a study? We need to analyze what are the benefits and risks involved with this Facebook. Since most of our population uses Facebook, so we, we need to know how do we need to deal with that? How, what are the negative outcomes? What are the predictors of this Facebook? What are the negative effects of this Facebook in order to stabilize our future, in order to confront our future with safe hands? So it is really, really essential to do an investigation about this Facebook intrusion. So what is the methodology that I have used? Since we are gathering non-numerical data, opinions, context, and we are gathering uh, details about negative effects, predictors. Uh, it is based on qualitative data. Since we are gathering non-numerical data and opinions context, we can say this is a qualitative research. Rather than getting a cross section of the society and studying about the Facebook intrusion of that particular society, it is really worthwhile if we can gather a gather lot of re research articles and gather details of those particular research articles from all around the areas, from different geographical locations. We can get into accurate information at the ultimate level. That's why we selected a literature survey. So uh, we did a comprehensive search in Google Scholar. Why did we select Google Scholar? Because it allows access to a wide range of articles, let me say. Then, what are the two search terms, significant search terms that we used? First one is Facebook and the second one is intrusion. Then, at the very beginning of this literature survey, uh, we gave the search terms as Facebook and intrusion. Then we we, uh, we were able to gather 466 articles altogether. And then we filtered those articles from last five years, starting from 2018 to 2023. After that, we were able to gather 75 articles altogether. After removing the, after filtering the redundant articles and unavailable entries and screening each and every article with their full text, abstract title, 
we were able to gather uh, 30 articles all together. And what are the things we unveiled in the ultimate level after screening, after carefully reviewing those articles? First of all, I would like to clarify you the inclusion of this uh, particular section. First of all, I would like to give you a little definition about a uh, brief definition about the Facebook intrusion, then the measuring Facebook intrusion, predictors of Facebook intrusion, and then I would like to unveil you about the negative effects of Facebook intrusion. So what is Facebook intrusion? According to Noller and Elfienstein, Facebook intrusion is the excessive involvement with uh, Facebook. Uh, uh, Facebook intrusion is the excessive involvement with Facebook, disrupting our daily activities and interpersonal relationships. And we, we came across something special. As synonyms for Facebook intrusion, we can use problematic Facebook use, addictive Facebook use, and Facebook addiction. After carefully reviewing those articles, we came across those synonyms as well. Those were interchangeably used for Facebook intrusion. And according to American Psychiatric Association, Facebook addiction yet not ha uh, has been recognized as a formal psychiatric disorder, I should say. And all those researchers have utilized three major measuring instruments in order to measure Facebook intrusion. What are those uh, major instruments? Bergen Facebook Addiction Scale, Facebook Addiction Scale, Facebook Intrusion Question. Let me draw your attention to the Bergen Facebook Addiction Scale. Originally, it contained 18 items, and afterwards, it uh, in the final edition, it only contained six uh, items and answered on a five-point Likert scale, starting from very rarely to very often. Then, Facebook Addiction Scale, it contained 20 items altogether. And lastly, the Facebook Intrusion Questionnaire. This is a mobile questionnaire developed by Elfenstein and Noller. It consists eight aspects and uh, it is also rated on a seven point Likert scale starting from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Uh, so these are the uh, measure, measurements or the eight aspect, aspects of a Facebook addiction questionnaire. Cognitive salience, behavioral salience, interpersonal conflict, conflict with other activities, euphoria, loss of control, withdrawal, relapse and reinstatement. Then, what are the predictors that we have gathered by investigating these articles, by understanding these articles? These are the predictors that we have gathered. Fear, narcissism related with satisfaction, low self-esteem, false self-presentation, like behaviors associated with depression, to symptoms, stress, anxiety. And uh, I should say that uh, Facebook intrusion also acted as a mediator in between self-esteem and stress and in between self-esteem and self-control as well. Depression, sleep problems, loneliness, and low ability or inability to suppress delay and unwanted and improper actions, Facebook addiction, and uh, impulsive behavioral patterns. These were the predictors that we have identified by gathering those articles. And when I'm to, uh, when, when if I unveil you about the negative effects of Facebook intrusion, we can identify sleep problems, loneliness, and low ability to focus on goals and less goal-oriented life, and emotional functioning, rumination, anxiety, Facebook usage with depressive symptoms, Obsessive life satisfaction, dissatisfaction with jealousy and uh, negative marital relationships. Those were the negative effects that we have uh, encountered after reviewing those articles. So what do I need to say at the ultimate level after reviewing these articles carefully? First of all, I have to say Facebook addiction, problematic Facebook use, or Facebook addictive use. All those synonyms or all those terms or Facebook intrusion consist negative effects for sure, such as narcissism, jealousy, relationship dissatisfaction, loneliness, depression, 
uh, reduce call oriented sleep problems and sight. But it is essential, it is essential to find a balance between in between Facebook usage and personal satisfaction. That is user's responsibility. And it is also important to strike about the balance between the private space and the emotional well-being when we are using Facebook. That are the things that we need to draw our attention that I have came across after reviewing these articles. And I should also emphasize that our individuals, our researchers, policy makers should implement necessary policies and do sufficient amount of researchers in order to mitigate this problem, in order to uh, rescue people from addictive or uh, Facebook intrusion so that we can find a balance in between our personal satisfaction and our private space. So these are the references that I have referred uh, in order to gather information. So I would like to ex express my sincere gratitude for your kind consideration and attention. May you have a great day. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. That was a literature survey on Facebook intrusion, predictors and effects. I think uh, all the participants here may be having Facebook account. So this study may be interested to all of us, including myself, so we can discuss uh, with our own experience. Shall we move to this uh, next presentation? Uh, that is of um, landslide for education. A case study from the mitigated landslide at Kahagal, Haputale area. And the presentation uh, is a joint paper of C. Senaviratna and P. Jai Singh. Uh, Chintani Senaviratna is from Gampaha, Vikramaraji University of Indigenous Medicine. She's an academic member of that university. And the uh, joint author, Dr. Padma Kumar Jai Singh, he is from University of Colombo, Department of Geography. Uh, and we invite you to make the presentation. Good afternoon, you all. Uh, I'm Chintani Seniratna, and my co-author is uh, Dr. Patma Kumar uh, Jai Singh. I'm here to present about landslide for education. This is a case study from a mitigated landslide at uh, Kahagala. It's in Haputale. I have divided my presentation into a few sections, as you can see on the screen. At the very first beginning, I would like to give you a brief uh, idea about landslide and education and Kahagala landslide site. Landslides are mass downslope movement of soil and rock material under gravity. Sri Lanka is a well-known country experiencing landslide disasters, as all of us know. And awareness and education in landslide hazards and disaster must be well established in country because we are facing this, uh, this uh, disaster. When given education on disasters, its practical engagement should be focused because we have to deal with uh, this kind of disasters. The importance of education is not only book learning, but also field work to give students valuable real world experiences. And also by doing this kind of uh, field work, we can go for deep study approaches. Landslide education is available in different fields such as geography, geology, civil engineering and disaster management. Here, our focus is about uh, Kahagala landslide site. This is a disaster uh, landslide mitigated site. Kahagala landslide is a creep type landslide and meteor hydrologically induced landslide. The Kahagala landslide has been mitigated by applied engineering measures. This site is one of the 16 proposed mitigation sites under the landslide disaster protection project in Sri Lanka. 
the best location for landslide education should be safe site. So that's why we consider this site because this is a landslide mitigated site. Our research question was, can the Kahagala landslide mitigated site use as an educational site? So our objective was to identify the potentials to use the Kahagala landslide mitigated site for educational purposes, along with the sub-objective to identify the nature of the Kahagala landslide and to identify the educational opportunities in this site. We have gone through a few literatures to emphasize the educational uh, validity of this uh, site and also uh, by focusing uh, Kahagala landslide. So we could identify the research gap. It is noticeable that the Kahagala landslide, landslide features geological condition and mitigation strategies are the only focus. The research gap remains to consider this site for the purpose of education. They are so, therefore, we have to focus on that. There are many examples on landslide awareness programs, but site-specific educational programs are less in literature. That's also one of the areas we should address. Then, specified landslide education site in Sri Lanka is not available, and the concept is fresh for Sri Lanka even in literature. The concept can be included in disaster risk reduction projects and uh, also the tourism project, how to bring uh, educators to this kind of sites. So um, now we are at the next uh, session of my presentation, it's methodology. This is a basic, exploratory, qualitative, non-experimental and inductive research. We have used interpretivism as the philosophy of this uh, research and also uh, inductive uh, approach we have used. And this is a case study um, and qualitative research when we consider data collection and data analysis, primary data and secondary data we have used. When we uh, focus the data analysis method, thematic analysis is the main uh, analysis method we have used. When we are using thematic analysis, this is the process we use for uh, doing this uh, thematic analysis in this research. Uh, after doing thematic analysis, uh, based on the collected data, we could identify three main themes. Those are location of the site, landslide education and Kahagala site, and benefits of using Kahagala site for education. Based on these three themes, we have um, organize our discussion session. Uh, for visualizing the uh, results, we have used map, diagrams, and also descriptive writing methods. And also we have um, done some uh, practices to validate of the accuracy of data, data since this is a qualitative research. Now we are at the uh, sec uh, section of uh, results and discussion. Possibilities to use this site as an educational site uh, we have considered because we have we wanted to emphasize Kahagala landslide as a educational site. Uh, first main thing what we could identify is the accessibility. Accessibility is very important when we are considering a site. Uh, so Hapatali um, Bandaravila Road runs. Um, across the toe of this landslide, they are for easily uh, accessible uh, place, uh, this Kah uh, Kahagala landslide. And also this is in um, Hapatali Divisional Secretariat uh, Division. So uh, in educational trip or the, uh, as the university uh, students, we can visit there and do the research and the uh, research work because uh, this is a very easily accessible area. Next uh, highlighted point is different countermeasures are in one side. Uh, we can identify there are uh, different uh, kind of countermeasures when we are considering the uh, landslide site. So uh, another special thing what we could identify when we are uh, doing our observational method in this site is the countermeasures. 
we could identify landslide monitoring instruments in located in this site. Those are water levels, strain gauges, and strain uh, gauges. And also, when considering landslide mitigation measures, there are many measures we could identify in this site. Those are drainage wells, soil nailing, and ground anchoring. Drainage systems are there, and also soil bio in the, in the, uh, engineering methods they have identified and also they have uh, applied in this site. They are so very, uh, this site is very important when we consider the countermeasures. When the students use this kind of site, we, um, they can identify the countermeasures, different countermeasures in uh, one site. Next one, what we could identify is link with an organization. National Building Research Organization is the um, main uh, organization uh, work for landslide in Sri Lanka. So they have involved with Kahagala mitig uh, landslide mitigated site as well. Therefore, if the educators are joining and working with uh, uh, this Kahagala uh, mitigated site, they, they can even uh, improve the relationship with National Building Research Organization also. And also policy and governance. When we consider policy and governance, um, the site has been mitigated as a collaborative effort of the public and private sectors. Uh, JICA, uh, National Building Research Organization, Road Development Authority, are some of the organizations collaboratively uh, work for this uh, site. So uh, when students are working uh, on policy and uh, governments regarding disaster, they have they, they will get a chance to study that kind of policy and governments regarding this Kahagala mitigated site. Next one, next fa factor we could identify is lessons in risk assessment and management. There are many risk assessment and management practices regarding Kahagala mitigated site. So one of the area we can identify when we uh, learn landslide education is risk assessment and the risk management. So this kind of to topic also can be uh, identified using uh, this site. Next one is uh, interdisciplinary nature of addressing landslide risk. When we are going to address in landslide risk, interdisciplinary uh, ways we have to uh, address. So, uh, Kahagala landslide, we could identify it. Uh, Kahagala landslide is a, a place to get this kind of uh, access as well. Next one is geotechnical engineering principles. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, slope stability analysis and soil stabilization methods, they have used in this Kahagala uh, mitigated site. Uh, when... Uh, the point of view of the geotechnical engineering principles, Kahagala mitigated site, we could identify it as a, a focal point to uh, get uh, information about this uh, type of geotechnical engineering principle methods. Next one is explore techniques. Slope monitoring, early warning system, land use planning to reduce vulnerability to landslides are also one of the mitigation methods when they what they have applied. So if the students wanna know about this kind of explore techniques and the things in at the field, uh, we could identify Kahagala mitigator site as a, a very uh, special site to identify. Next one is information available in scientific paper. As a, a university community, academics, scientific uh, papers are very important. So when we consider Kahagala mitigated site, uh, there are uh, different uh, information available as a scientific papers. As, uh, as we discuss, sorry. as we discuss in literature review, uh, there we could identify different uh, scientific research papers also regarding Kahagala landslide site. So with this uh, results and discussion, our conclusion uh, is by studying the Kahagala landslide mitigated site, student and professionals can gain valuable knowledge about landslide 
landslide mitigation strategies, their implementations, and the importance of comprehensive planning and monitoring. This case study serves as a practical resource for educators and researchers to identify the landslide with the aim of enhancing understanding and preparedness for landslide in vulnerable areas. Our research question was, can the Kahagala landslide mitigation site used as an educational site? Answer is yes. So with this answer, there is another question, then how we can use this site as an educational site? With this question, I would like to go for the recommendation of the, our presentation. Uh, first, uh, first one is use this kind of available sites in Sri Lanka to enhance practical knowledge in uh, of education. Second one is how to use this site as the educational site uh, should uh, be further studied and also stakeholders. We could identify different stakeholders regarding education, landslide, and also Kahagala landslide site. So it's uh, it's necessary to do uh, stakeholder analysis uh, as well. Uh, when we are considering education system, yes, we teach students uh, with the book learning process and also the practical session. So uh, here our main consideration is to use um, practical sessions uh, and also use a site in Sri Lanka for our practical sessions. Therefore, uh, we have identified Kahagala landslide site as a very important place to use as a practical uh, practicals and the field work to enhance the knowledge of uh, landslide mitigation and also disaster risk reduction areas. These are the references what we have used. Thank you. Thank you, Chintani, for your presentation. And the study was jointly authored by uh, Dr. Jayasinghe and Chintani Seneviratna. The topic was uh, landslides for education, a case study from mitigated landslides at Kahagal Habutali. Shall we go to the next presentation? That is uh, the topic. The title of the paper is Towards the Conceptualization and the Operationalization of the Construct of Occupational Stress. And the paper will be presented by uh, Mrs. Sandeepani. Sorry, MHR Sandeepani. Uh, and together, the other authors, uh, the uh, MHR Sandeepani is presently reading for PhD in management at University of Sri Jayavardhanapur. She has completed MBA, Kalania, BSc, uh, National Diploma Training and HRD, National Diploma HRM, NIBM, IPICT, Yonik, Denmark. Uh, MHR Sandeepani is currently working as the Senior Assistant Registrar at General Sir John Kodalawala Defense University. Together, the other authors of the paper are uh, P. N. Gamage from University of Kalania, G. D. N. Pereira uh, from University of Sri Jayavardhanapura, T. L. Sanjeevani from University of Sri Jayavardhanapura. We invite Sandeepani to make your presentation.
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to present you one of a significant topic related to the fields of social sciences as well as human resource management. This is an interesting topic in order to manage the occupational stress properly while enhancing employees' performances as well as while enhancing the organizational productivity. In my research, the co-authors are Professor P. N. Gamage from University of Kalania and Professor G. D. N. Pereira and Professor T. L. Sajivani from University of Sri Jayawardenepura. So, towards the conceptualization and the operationalization of the construct of occupational stress. This is the flow of my presentation. So this is the flow of my presentation. First, we'll move to the introduction. Occupational stress is considered as one of a prominent risk factors among the employees in the global industrial context, including the manufacturing settings as well as the service settings. Because the employees who are working in the organizations are vastly pressurized on their job results, as well as they have embraced physically and mentally in order to cope up with high workloads in their work settings, as well as diverse job roles. So occupational stress has become a prime concern among not only the HR managers and HR practitioners, but also among the employers as well as research scholars. According to this diagram, you can see the global economic recession, constant technological changes, managerial attitudes, as well as corrupt competitive work environments have primarily contributed on a stressful work environment in most of the organizational settings. If it is not properly managed, this phenomenon called occupational stress, it will lead for destructive and detrimental consequences among both the employee's well-being as well as organizational productivity. Because there are a number of negative impacts on both employees and the organizations. For instance, ill health condition, poor performances, job dissatisfaction among the employees of organizational setting, as well as uh, we uh, can observe frequent absenteeism rates as well as high labor turnover rates in the organizational setting. Typically, the employees of the organizations are obligatory to perform diverse tasks, learn novel skills, as well as require to meet organizational competitive demands. So, however, these conditions led for more fluid jobs, role ambiguity, as well as role conflicts while evolving this phenomenon called occupational stress. So there are three key objectives of our research study. The first objective is to establish a novel, pragmatic, practical definition for the construct of occupational stress. The second objective is to explore the diverse dimensions and the elements for the construct of occupational stress. The third objective is to develop a comprehensive instrument in measuring the construct of occupational stress. Next, we'll move to the literature review. So we'll see the evolution of the concept of occupational stress. At the initial stages, Cloud burnout has contributed towards the development of the concept called stress at the beginning. Later on, Walter Cannon also used the concept of stress to describe the emotional status of the organisms throughout his research series. Then occupational stress concept can be traced through non-experimental studies performed during early 1960s with American employees. According to the findings of that research study, more than one third or one third of employees in their national sample were highly experiencing this detrimental phenomenon called occupational stress. So according to this diagram, you can see different key approaches to occupational stress revealed by diverse scholars throughout the research antiquity. 
And you can see the taxonomy of occupational stress-related theories. So in our research, we have identified a few key contemporary interaction theories. For instance, the person environment fit theory, job demand control theory, burnout theory, and so on. So I would like to dis uh, discuss with you briefly on occupational stress in work life. So occupational stress can be arisen through overload or else through underload. According to the inverted U curve between occupational stress and employee performances, invented by Omara in 1988, as you can see in this diagram, employees' performances will be improved with the growing stress level up to an optimum level. So beyond that optimum point, performances of the employees will be diminished. So there are two key terms called eustress, uh, which is simply in terms good stress, and de-stress simply in terms bad stress. So eustress is experienced with the optimum stress level, while de-stress is experienced beyond the optimum stress level through overloading or else underloading. So eustress may be more benefited for uh, specifically for employee motivation but the de-stress will be detrimentally affected to employee psychological uh, conditions over time period. So we have reviewed several definitions on occupational stress concept revealed by diverse scholars in the research antiquity. So according to this table, Stanley in 1956 and Foreman and Myers in 1987, initial stages, they have defined the concept of stress at the beginning point. Later on, several scholars have defined the concept of occupational stress throughout the development of this phenomenon of occupational stress. So I would like to move with you to the uh, next key part of our research, the research methodology. We have adopted the archival method together with the systematic literature review based on the Kahn et al's 2003 five steps of systematic literature review process. So similar methodological approaches have been practiced linked to the arena of occupational stress in the prior research history by Fletcher and Pine in 1980. So the systematic literature review process has enclosed published research articles related to the arenas of HRM, organizational behavior and psychology. We have utilized academic research databases uh, such as Emerald Insight, Taylor and Francis Juster and so on. So accordingly, 126 published, uh, published research articles were initially scrutinized. After eliminating the irrelevance as well as the duplicates, 96 published research articles were systematically reviewed in order to conceptualize, operationalize, and to develop the instrument for the concept of occupational stress. So according to this table, you can see the utilized search terms, strings, and expressive explanations uh, throughout the systematic literature review process. So uh, we have uh, identified six search screening conditions and we utilize those six uh, search screening conditions for the systematic literature review process. A wide ranging time period from 1872 to 2020 was considered as the time window of the research study because we had a requirement for an in-depth exploration of the concept along with its evolution. So due to availability of a rare number of studies related to the arena of the occupational stress, we had to use a wide span time window. So according to this table, you can see the key search screening conditions which were applied for inclusion and exclusion of published research articles in the process of systematic literature review. So accordingly, the first uh, research uh, the first search screening condition was the language of the article. So the inclusion criteria was the English language written articles. So we have excluded the articles which are written in any other languages other than the English. The second uh, search screening condition was the format of the article. The inclusion criteria was the full text uh, articles and the exclusion criteria was the abstract only. So the third uh, Search screening condition was type of article. So research articles published, uh, published in the scientific peer-reviewed journals 
were included and research articles published in non-scientific, non-peer-reviewed journals were excluded. The period uh, was the uh, fourth search screening condition. The time window between 1872 to 2020 is the inclusion criteria. Before 1872 is the exclusion criteria. The fifth uh, third screening condition was the relevance in terms of research arena of occupational stress. The sixth uh, third screening uh, condition was the relevance in terms of conceptualization, operationalization, and development of the instrument for the construct of occupational stress. Next, I would like to move with you one of the key part of our research study towards the conceptualization of the concept construct of occupational stress. Uh, so, based on the various definitions specified by diverse scholars throughout the research antiquity and development of the concept of occupational stress, we have developed a pragmatic working definition specifically based on three noteworthy definitions specified by B.N. Newman in 1978, Montgomery et al. in 1996 and USNIOS 1999. Accordingly, the pragmatic uh, working definition was occupational stress is the employee's responsiveness of personal dysfunction as a result of perceived workplace conditions and harmful physiological, psychological, and emotional responses caused by these uncomfortable workplace conditions. So next, I would like to move with you towards the operationalization of the construct of occupational stress. According to Bryman and Belt, uh, 2011, occupation, uh, operationalization encompasses translating the psychological world into physical world. So based on the established work in definition, we have identified six key dimensions for the construct of occupational stress as follows. So dimension number one is the responsibility pressure. So resp uh, it entails four key elements, as you can see here. So uh, according to this table, you can see the question items developed for key elements of dimension of responsibility pressure based on House et al. 1979. So dimension number two is the quality concern. There are three key elements. You can see the question items developed based on House et al. 1979. Dimension number three is the role conflict. So there are three key elements. And uh, you can see the question items developed for the key element uh, for the dimension of role conflict based on House et al. 1979. Dimension number four is job versus non-job conflict. So three key elements were identified. You can see the question items developed based on how settled 1979. Dimension number five is the workload. There are three key elements. You can see the question items developed based on how settled 1979. The sixth dimension is employee dysfunction responses, which entails three key elements. So you can see the question items developed based on Palacio et al. 2022, Edwards et al. 1998. So according to this diagram, you can see uh, the key dimensions for the construct of occupational stress with its diverse elements. So these are the derived sources of question items. You can see the range of question items developed instrument, and you can see the sources. Then finally, I would like to move with you to the conclusion. So we have developed a pragmatic con uh, pragmatic work in definition for the construct of occupational stress, which is matched to the present scenario. So we have identified six key dimensions for this specific construct. So we have developed a co comprehensive instrument in order to measure the specific uh, construct called occupational stress. The limitation is this is limited for an instrument development, but we are going to recommend you to uh, implementation of this instrument in order to measure the construct of occupational stress in emphatically by using the employee's perspectives. And uh, we can uh, use uh, the occupational stress construction discreetly, or else uh, we are recommending to accompany this construct with other constructs linked to diverse organizational settings, including manufacturing and service settings. So we are recommending to validate 
and uh, reliability assessment of this instrument specifically matched to different industrial settings. So uh, this is a significant knowledge pool for entire uh, HRM and sociological field. So these are the key references of our research study. So thank you very much who have concentrated our research findings and uh, thank you and have a pleasant day. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. MHR Sandeepani uh, for making the presentation and she was joined by three other authors, P. N. Gamage, G. D. N. Pereira and T. L. Sanjeevani. All three are professors. So we are very happy uh, with this presentation also. And we will move to the uh, last presentation. Uh, the title of the paper is The Effectiveness of Prog Progressive Muscle Relaxation in Managing Adjustment Disorder Among Apparel Sector Employees in Sri Lanka. This uh, paper uh, will be uh, presented by P. Jayatilaka who is a PhD candidate of the Faculty of Graduate Studies of General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. In addition, uh, right. and two co-authors, uh, uh, Dr. Lakshika Lienagi and uh, M.W. Gunatung. We invite to make the presentation now. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you for the opportunity. And... Uh, Good afternoon, all of you. Uh, I should mention here about the other uh, two uh, contributors to this study, Dr. Lakshika Liyanage and Professor Vasanta Gunatunga. And uh, I'm presenting, I'm Prasanna Jayatilka, presenting on behalf of my team. And as a PhD student, this is a part of my study. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to three key areas. One is the progressive muscle relaxation, which is a psychological intervention, and the adjustment disorder, and the other one is the apparel sector employees. So, uh, uh, in the next few minutes, I would like to tell you the overview of my research. So, this is the outline of my research. And um, what is the adjustment disorder? So we heard about the stress, occupational stress and so on. This is the most common psychological disorder in the therapeutic setting. This is a stress-related disorder. And this has been classified uh, under the DSM classification, which is the global uh, accepted classification uh, for the psychological disorders. And ICD classification also it is mentioned, Diagnostics and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So the individual who is suffering from adjustment disorder, it is a stressful condition. After the individual is exposed to an identifiable stressful condition, he or me, he, he, the individual may uh, suffer from different psychological, physiological, problems affecting the day-to-day -day functions, right? So uh, according to the diagnostic criteria of DSM-5 classification, emotional and behavioral responses are very common, affecting social, occupational, that is related to their job, and also other areas, maybe educational, maybe um, uh, physical, as well. So uh, this must, the onset must happen within the three months of the exposure and this should last uh, mo not more than six months. That is the diagnostic criteria generally. <clears throat> so uh, let me tell you about the therapeutic interventions. So in counseling, a psychological counseling, we use a lot of therapeutic interventions in dealing with psychological problems. And as you can see, there are a lot of therapies available here. 
can see the there are so many therapies and PMR, this is our main focus. The, this model is the main focus of the study, progressive muscle relaxation. So what is this progressive muscle relaxation? So it is a <clears throat> therapeutic intervention used by the counselors normally to deal with many disorders, not only in adjust, with adjust, adjustment disorder, but also anxiety and other, you know, even for somatic condition that can be used. So in here, in PMR, the individual is taught how to uh, contract and release the muscle groups of the whole body. As you can see in this picture, so from the bottom to the top, the client is, the psychology, the, the person is taught, the individual is taught how to progressively, progressively change the contract and releasing the muscles and thereby it affects the physiology and the psychology of the person. And this has been developed actually long ago in 1920s by Edmund Jacobson, but the lot of research globally has been conducted to see the effectiveness of this model and it has proven that this model is very effective. So in here, why we have chosen the apparel industry? As we have heard earlier also, the work environment is normally very stressful, right? And the adjustment disorder, which is the stress-related problem, is very common in the work settings, and especially in the apparel industry, right? And it is one of the largest industries in Sri Lanka. And also, it covers 15% of the total uh, workforce in Sri Lankan society. And uh, obviously, apparel industry, the, it has a high prevalence rate of stress. So therefore, we have chosen that area, especially we have focused on the middle layer of the management, middle level of people. So top level and the lower level, and we focus on the below. They are highly vulnerable for stresses. They are pressurized from both ends, right? So, um, uh, so, and the other important things that I want to mention here, this kind of study has not been done in the Sri Lankan context. Globally, it has been done a lot of stress, a lot of uh, research, but this is the first, uh, the initiative uh, in the Sri Lankan context, especially in the apparel industry. No one has done this earlier. And this is the methodology. Uh, we employed the quanti um, quantitative research framework and of course the purpose of sampling method. So obviously it's a quasi experimental approach and the uh, rest of the thing. <clears throat> Interestingly, we have used four measuring scales, multiple measuring scales for this study. Um, we'll be discussing about later. Um, as you can see here, the ADNM 20, last 21, GXQ12, and the K10. Those are the multiple measuring scales we used in this study. So the 20 counselors were employed here to conduct this strategy for, for the screening the sufferers from that apparel industry. And we have identified the 91 people for this study. Uh, they are positive. They were positive. Uh, for adjustment disorder, and uh, and the positive people, the positive uh, participants were divided into two groups. One is the intervention group or the test group, and the other one is the control group, which has no intervention. And the PMR uh, conducted in eight weeks. That's an eight week intervention. <clears throat> so pre and post tests were conducted uh, using the four scales here and we uh, collected data. <clears throat> so 91 participants were in the sample, and interestingly, more than 54% of the people, uh, of the uh, clients or the participants were female, and the majority uh, were under the age group 26 to 35, very young people, right? Middle level managers. And more than 61.5, percent of the people had some prominent academic qualification as well, more than A-levels, and some people had diplomas as well. 
So the results are very interesting, right? As you can see, you can see, now this is the control group, look at this. Uh, this is the control group and this is the interventional group. You can see the decrease of the symptoms, right? According to the wilkerson sign rand test. And, uh, and this is the increase of, this is the control group which shows the increase of the symptoms, right? Clearly indicated, and all the, the the results are all aligned with the uh, all uh, the results of the four scales are all aligned. That is, all the uh, indicators show just the same results. That's a very interesting finding. And also, the the p value should be um, less than zero 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 five point five uh, to uh, see the significant. So uh, statistically significant results found here. You can see the according to Manwitz Institute test, uh, all the all the scales gave us the uh, p value is less than zero point zero five. So this is statistically significant. So therefore, we can say the PMR intervention in dealing with the adjustment disorder on this group was effective. So. Uh, Middle level management is very vulnerable, as I told you earlier. And uh, eight week intervention, actually, we gathered so many information. We interviewed them, we discussed with them, and they all said that uh, the this intervention is very effective, not only to dealing with stresses, but also to deal with the other functional areas, other co co component uh, in their lives as well. And also, uh, four scales are very important, multiple measurements. The two, and we could use only one one measurement, and we use here the ADNM, which is the gold standard uh, uh, measuring scale for adjustment disorder. But uh, the other scales also ensured the results. So um, that was very uh, very uh, interesting. And when compared with the control group, we had the significant change in the reduction of. Uh, adjustment disorder symptoms and uh, and uh, and i looked for the the what the others have done globally and we found a very good uh, research finding the iranian research found the same thing this uh, this they have conducted two week pmr intervention also uh, and finally they got the very positive uh, result uh, in the uh, last 21 they have used and there's a nine month PMR intervention had done in uh, Malaysia also found the same type of result. And also here in Greece, they have uh, done a similar type of intervention and found a very positive result. But this is the first time intervention in the Sri Lankan context in the apparel industry. And, uh, and this study supports the existing empirical studies uh, and PMR can alleviate the symptoms of adjustment disorder. And, uh, and that will increase the other uh, key areas of, and lot of, there are a lot of self, the health benefits as well. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we can create by employing this type of therapeutic intervention, we create the better, you know, psychological friendly env environment in the work settings. And also, uh, uh, we can focus on the other segments also. I focused on the middle level manager and the top level and the bottom level also can be considered. And not only in the apparel industry, but also in other uh, work related uh, industries we can use. And the further research should be conducted more than this to strengthen the results. And uh, I would like to suggest all of you to focus on this area because the the participant told us so many things, so many interesting things, the effectiveness of the psychological aspects uh, in dealing with all these uh, things. And uh, I think uh, we should uh, draw our attention to these areas to do more research and more uh, therapeutic intervention of this nature. And uh, these are my references. And, uh, and uh, I must sincerely uh, pay my gratitude for the inspiration, support, and guidance for my supervisors, Dr. Lakshika, the NGA, and uh, Professor Vasanta Gunatunga, and their 
continuous support was highly valuable. And everyone who helped me in the study, the other counselors and the research assistants, especially the management uh, uh, of the organization. And we did the research in different locations and the, we had to pay our gratitude to them. And also the KDU, Kotala Defense University and the FGS Faculty of Graduate Studies who gave me the opportunity to conduct this type of work. And also uh, the participants especially, um, they had a lot of stresses and a lot of problems, but they participated in our study. So must thank all of them and the everyone who supported me, my family, other people, and I must thank them, all of them. <clears throat> And also, if you have questions and concerns, uh, you can ask uh, at the end. And uh, this is a PMR intervention. And this is very interesting to must learn everyone to combat with stresses, not only adjustment disorder, right? And if you practice this every day, you can avoid stresses. You can combat stresses, right? Very interesting. You can find in books. Uh, this is the procedure. Very interesting. And. Uh, and these are some of the pictures uh, we have taken during the intervention. Uh, that's all in short. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation on effectiveness of progressive muscle relaxation in managing adjustment disorder among apparel sector employees in Sri Lanka. It was done by uh, P. Jayatilaka. And the uh, paper was supported, or jointly authored by Dr. Lakshika Lienagi and also Professor P. W. Gunatunga. Uh, all the five presentations have been completed by now, and it is time for the questions and answers, or even comments. Uh, we would be happy if the audience uh, can raise your hands and uh, give your comments for the papers and get the responses further from all this. Who will be starting? Yes, Dr. Tamara. Uh, yeah, thank you for all the presentations. They were very interesting uh, presentations and we learned a lot about uh, different issues and uh, how to handle them. Uh, my question is to uh, Mr. Jayatilaka. You, you um, say that uh, from that intervention, PMR methodology, you were able to see a decrease. But what is the decrease? Is it like uh, onset of uh, like uh, the duration or how did you see the decrease? Yeah, actually, madam, we used four scales, as I mentioned. Uh, that's 21. Uh, the, uh, in the uh, DSM-20, uh, 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 Adjustment Disorder New Module 20 and the K10 and the GHQ-12. So those are the scales. So before the intervention, we, we screened the participants. At... Quick thing, uh, assume we are not, I'm not from a medical background, so uh, I don't know. Ah, oh, okay. So no, at the beginning, we administered the, all these four scales to them. And accordingly, we got the data. That is a questionnaire, basically, right? So we use four questionnaires, then gave them, and then we identified the sufferers, and then we made the inter intervention on them for eight weeks. And then at the end, the same scales was used. And you can see the difference. So we did the statistical analysis to see there's a differences. Yes. Oh, questions? Manuri, you want to? Ask question. Yes. Uh, good evening. So my question goes to C. Senevrat, madam. So in your, uh, when you were explaining uh, all the findings and stuff, can you explain some uh, some of the risks that can be associated with uh, using Kahagal as an educational uh, place? Yes. Uh, in our research, what we did was uh, Kahagala landslide is a, a, a before mitigating that site, it was a landslide um, site. It uh, villages and the uh, road users affected from that landslide. After that, as a, a 
mitigation uh, project under mitigation project in Sri Lanka, it was mitigated, right? So in our research, what our focus was, landslide education is there. In landslide education, there are different categories to learn. One is uh, from the beginning, uh, we can identify the introduction to landslide and also the risk and the mitigation methods in landslide and also the stakeholders in landslide and the technical uh, measures in landslide. Likewise, in education system under landslide education, we can identify the categories. So when we are learning these categories in our research, what we did was identify the features in regarding this Kahagala landslide, uh, landslide site. So before uh, applying these mitigated measures, in Kahagala landslide site, there were risks there. And also, as I mentioned in my presentation, there are scientific papers to prove that risk. Based on the identified landslide risk, government and the National Building Research Organization has identified, yes, this is the site to be mitigated. Right? So in my presentation, I wanted to highlight if a student and also educator or a researcher wants to identify about, learn, especially learn about landslide and also landslide risk and methods to mitigation, this site can be highlighted as a site for their field works. That's why, uh, that's what I wanted to mention in the paper. So my question is goes to the last speaker. Uh, are there any self-help strategies or technique for managing this uh, adjustment disorders in apparel industry that we can use practically in the industry levels? Uh, thank you for the question. And actually, we developed a manual also for this. Actually, we used two interventions. One is PMR, as I mentioned, India, and the other one is MBSR, Mindfulness-Based uh, uh, Stress Reduction. <clears throat> For that, actually, we developed manual. They are the participants uh, were given a lot of homework with the guidance, with the self-help book for them to do uh, homework practices, right? Still, that is going on, right? So there is a mechanism of supervising. Still, it's happening. They are still utilizing that manual and the part of that manual. It is happening. Yes, sir. Thank you. Are they implemented by the government? Uh, any government help for these strategies? Uh, you mean government institution? Yes. Uh, not really. As far as I, 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 I don't know, but this is only apparel industry, one uh, major leading apparel organization in Sri Lanka. Yes, thank you. And as I told you, this is the first time intervention first time effort in Sri Lankan in the Sri Lankan context, especially in the apparel industry. Any other? Yes, Dr. Lakshira. Psychology plus social work background. Now, uh, very interesting because I know really people talk about uh, the intervention by the social workers in the Sri Lankan context as they always, uh, there is always this confusion between Samaja Sevaka, Samaja Vedakaru, likewise. So, uh, my question to you is now, um, you have talked about the importance of social work as a practicing profession to enhance gender mainstreaming. Now, with my understanding, now a social worker can play like five to eight roles, right, as a facilitator, as a teacher, as a listener, likewise. So which particular roles do you think a social worker can use in uh, this uh, enhancing gender mainstreaming? Mm -hmm. Uh, in my opinion, actually, as far as I have studied and I have worked with, I think all those roles should be integrated in order to concern gender mainstreaming. But uh, for my opinion, I think mostly if we can focus on both practical as well as policy-based aspects like social work, which related to social, uh, what we call uh, policy-based uh, social work and uh, what we call as... Uh, community participation that will be uh, like perfect for an example like uh, in Sri Lanka we have gender focal points at present but the problem is that actually uh, there is no evidence to show that all of like at least 
majority of them are social workers. I don't know whether either one of them are social workers, like professional social workers. So I think the main reason is that people are being educated enough. That's all right. They are graduated. There are gender specialists who are being in charge of these gender focal points. That's all right. They have the theoretical knowledge. But as you said, ma'am, it's very much important to incorporate the listening skills, the cooperative skills, as well as community participation, uh, especially that is the main point because social workers are the people who should work with the community, not just having the theoretical knowledge. So I think those practical skills, listening, uh, communication, and uh, participation are very much important for social workers to enhance gender mainstreaming. That is the main difference between incorporating just merely a gender specialist and a social worker. That's what I think. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I uh, use mainly the UN uh, UNICEF's uh, gender mainstreaming principles as well as how it has been used within the Sri Lankan context. So it's, is it specific to certain organizations uh, where social workers? Yes, ma'am. It's like specific to UNICEF. Uh, the guiding principles of gender mainstreaming and also used within the Sri Lankan context too. Like same thing uh, used within Sri Lankan context, UNICEF principles. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Comments? I would also like to give some uh, comments and uh, questions. Uh, I would like to ask uh, questions starting from your presentation which is uh, social work as a practicing profession to enhance gender mainstreaming. There we found uh, about 11 components in the gender mainstreaming, like uh, recognition, diversity, equality, empowerment, participation, and so on. So I believe uh, it's a very complex role to be played by the social worker. Yeah. So... Uh, how do you accept these challenges in the context of uh, uh, social worker has some limited power? Mm -hmm. he, he or she has to obey the, comply with the uh, uh, guidance of the uh, main institution. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the person has to comply with the government regulations. So how do you manage this uh, complex situation? Actually, that is one of one of the main uh, challenges that social workers are play, facing currently because uh, like uh, at the present, they have to be adhere to all the cultural uh, aspects as well as the religious aspects in Sri Lanka. So uh, the one of my recommendations is to indigenize social work uh, knowledge within Sri Lankan context. Like currently we have different uh, social work uh, uh, like offering uh, course contents in the uh, Sri Lanka but the problem is that they are mostly using the westernized concepts mm -hmm. so if we can concern both uh, the cultural aspect as well as the social work ethics if we can create like localized social work ethics a kind of uh, a documentation for that purpose then I think it's kind of easy for us to like be more focused on implementing these uh, principles explained by UNICEF because UNICEF principles are very much uh, what we call uh, very globalized as well as common to each country. But if we can indigenize those concepts according to our values, then that could be perfect according to my opinion. Our dean, sir, in the conference proceedings and we were discussing some uh, comments and questions for the paper presented. Uh, I will. Uh, I would like to move to the next presentation that is on literature survey on Facebook intrusion. Um, there we found that uh, Facebook is a negative approach. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah. Good afternoon to you all. Yes, yeah. sir. Um, Actually, when we are talking about the Facebook usage, it is a it, you know, we need to balance in between the uh, personal life and the Facebook usage. If we cross that limit, if we overuse the Facebook, we will confront with those negative consequences. Uh, that's how I confront the those negative consequences because when 
pe people are excessively using Facebook. That means Facebook intrusion, in other words, or problematic Facebook usage. In that point forward, we will come across those negative consequences. Like uh, Facebook has no positive impact as well uh, with your comments. Now, uh, if you look at uh, the Facebook uh, behavior of the people, yes, we can see that uh, they, they have to uh, start opening their account and then uh, reading the Facebook messages uh, and then reacting, giving some messages and also giving some uploading. So there are several activities to be done. And we have seen that some uh, Facebook uh, uh, members are using positively this, this uh, social media, uh, including myself. <laughs> I have many friends and I, I get good messages from them, uh, but I am not an addict. But uh, maybe as your point is taken, uh, it is it yes. will give some bad impression to the young yes. uh, school children, and that's not a good thing for them. We yes, sir. It, so yes, sir, it, your it, research is a very much a relevant one. But yes. uh, you should mention that one also the positive side also. I believe. Yes, sir. So yeah, as you mentioned, it surely has a positive many positive outcomes. Yes, yes. But the case is when we are crossing the limit and when we are overusing the Facebook, that's the point where we can class those all those kind of negative things. That's the case. And you have that's mentioned some addictive symptoms like uh, secondary effects like sleeping disorders. Yes. Sir. And uh, can we uh, blame the Facebook for those things? Because th that is, uh, that those things are, I believe, secondary effects. Yeah, secondary even, effects. Even when yes. we read newspapers, we may have sleeping <laughs> disorders. But it yes. is not directly related to Facebook. <laughs> uh, so yes. how do you like to uh, respond? To yes. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a problem starts with the problematic Facebook usage. Even we, if we don't have Facebook, hmm. uh, we might uh, come across with, with those problems in our day-to-day -day yes. lives. That's for sure. Yeah. But... It starts with the Facebook intrusion. In other words, I would say problematic Facebook usage because people don't know how to tackle their life in between their personal life and with the Facebook. That's the case. In your presentation, you haven't mentioned that uh, there should be any kind of regulations by the government. Why yes, not? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, in the ultimate section, in the conclusion section, I suggested that uh, policymakers should come up with necessary policies in order to mitigate this problem. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very and much. Then shall we move to the third presentation that is on uh, landslides for education. Uh, it is a case study from mitigated landslide happened in Kahagala Kaputale. And you have uh, clearly outlined the location as an educational site, but you haven't mentioned who should be there for learning. Yes. They are school children or researchers at university level? What is yeah. your... Sir, uh, in recommendation uh, section, I have mentioned that we uh, as a, the, taking this study as a desk research, we have to go for a second research as a stakeholder analysis because when I'm doing literature review, I could identify many stakeholders. Uh, it can be school students, university students, researchers, academics, and also not on, only limited to this kind of stakeholders. Uh, from uh, institutional side, it can be national building research organization and also other government parties. We can uh, uh, we can consider these uh, parties as a, a collaborative effort uh, when we are considering this site as an educational. Uh, sites. In this research, I have not included that stakeholder analysis part there. In the recommendation section, I have suggested we should go for a, a stakeholder analysis and also uh, to consider 
if we are going to use this site as educational site, how we should do it? Because that's a mitigated site and also a national building research organization has declared that this is now this is a safe site to use uh, for uh, other activities. Based on their recommendation, we have to think how we should use this site as an educational site. And I think in addition to this uh, site to be named as an educational site, I believe uh, there may be some tourism also. Uh, I don't know why you forget it uh, to include in this uh, presentation. We know that dark tourism is part of the uh, tourism industry. Yes. There are people would be happy, not really happy. They want to see the situation, uh, uh, others' grievances, others' uh, experience, they want to understand. So that is uh, as a part of tourism. Yes. Uh, so thank you so much for your comment. Not only dark tourism, actually for disaster tourism, dark tourism, and also eco-tourism, uh, geo-tourism, uh, this kind of tourism sector, uh, sectors also we can open. This is the part of uh, my research, what I have done based on the use in this site as a tourist site. So from that uh, research, I got this part at how to consider this uh, site as an uh, educational site. Sir. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, shall we move to the thank next you. presentation? It was done by MHR Sandeepani with uh, three other authors. That is about uh, the conceptualization and the operationalization. And your objective was to produce an instrument. Yes. I think you have produced that instrument yes. in this presentation. Yes. Uh, but my question is, uh, you haven't given the details of how to measure it. I mean, ah. measure in values. Yeah. Is it between 0 to 100 uh, or 0 to 10? And then what what weightage you give to the different components? Would you like to explain that? So, uh, yeah, sir. Uh, uh, in uh, the instrument, uh, there are several questions under key dimensions and under key dimensions, there are various elements identified. So uh, based on this uh, questionnaire, so um, our plan is to measure it uh, through the Likert scale, zero to five. Uh, see, see, uh, so uh, one to five Likert scale. Uh, so then uh, that uh, for each and every question items, we are going to give number five for the highly satisfied for the specific question, then uh, number four to be satisfied, number three to be uh, s s neither satisfied or dissatisfied, and uh, number two for uh, dissatisfied, then number one for highly dissatisfied likewise. Uh, our intention is to use the Likert scale for the entire questionnaire, sir. And uh, the quantitative analysis uh, uh, is the main approach. Uh, we are going to collect the data through the questionnaire-based survey and the quantitative data will be acquired. And we are going to uh, actually, uh, since this is uh, an instrument, uh, so this is the developed instrument, uh, our intention is to uh, uh, validate this instrument for specific, specific uh, context. Uh, in our research study, actually, we are targeted upon the Sri Lankan IT software service industry, sir. Uh, so we are, because uh, when consider the IT software service industry, uh, more than 90% employees are IT professionals. So IT professionals, uh, through our preliminary interviews and the observations, we have acquired the details that most of the IT professionals are vastly pressurized on their jobs and achieving results and uh, they are coping with high workloads and diversified uh, roles in their jobs. So they are uh, facing for this occupational stress uh, detrimental phenomenon. So we are going to implement, we are going to collect the data from IT professionals of Sri Lankan IT software service industry. Uh, so we are going to launch the questionnaire-based survey. And after collecting the uh, data, quantitative data, we are going to measure the reliability 
and uh, we are going to uh, check the validity of the questionnaire. So under reliability, we are going to uh, test the uh, through the test tree test uh, test, uh, as well as the uh, cron batch alpha values we are going to uh, acquire for uh, this entire questionnaire. Then first we are going to validate and check the reliability of the questionnaire going to the realistic scenarios. Now, when you uh, you have already produced the instrument yes, and sir. when you test it, yes, you sir. will find real uh, situation. Yeah. There, you will allocate a score yes. for each employee. Yeah, sir. So what is the boundary where you will find a person is not having stress or a person is having stress? Uh, what, is the, what is the score level where you will find no stress and there, there will be stress? Uh, have you thought of that? Uh, actually, sir, uh, in our research study, we have taken this occupational stress variable as the moderating variable for a relationship between talent management and employee branding. So in our uh, research, we are going to check the moderating effect of the occupational stress mainly, sir. Due to there are two sides, eustress and de-stress, we could be able to see uh, whether the use stress is applied or else the de-stress stress is applied or else within the middle level likewise sir. Uh, still we didn't uh, uh, assign a, a score for the level of stress uh, since uh, it is collaborated with uh, further other three variables in our uh, entire conceptual framework of our, of our research studies so the final uh, outcome yes sir. will there be any like uh, green amber red colors can you divide into three groups the people yes sir. we could be able, able. Sir. yes sir. Right. Uh, in quantitative uh, actually uh, non-statistical analysis uh, we could be able to get uh, such kinds of stress levels uh, stress. through the descriptive analysis uh, for various designational categories of the organization uh, the, among the IT professionals for instance the junior middle top level likewise and uh, the different uh, various areas as well quality assurance technology and so on uh, so likewise uh, we could be able to get that uh, stress level sir, through the descriptive analysis possibly if you find a red level uh, employees yes sir. and you will uh, recommend and refer those uh, people to your colleague yes. here <laughs> for uh, <laughs> managing adjustment yes. disorder <laughs> yes. so the final presentation is very much interested Thanks. Interesting and uh, the somewhat there is, we can see the similarities in your approach as well. Uh, I think uh, yeah, you were saying that this is a unique study in Sri Lanka. Yes, sir. We haven't seen uh, this kind of studies in, in Sri, Sri Lanka. Lanka. Now, I would like to know uh, under what circumstances you can conduct this study. Is it a clinical study or community oh, study? Yeah. Thank you for the question, sir. Actually, this is a clinical study done under social settings. Mm. Of course, we actually we um, use their premises to conduct the study. So normally we uh, do P PMR, this is progressive muscle relaxation in our clinical settings in the counseling room. But we went to the society, we went to the, their premises and used their uh, own places to conduct the study. Mm. So done in the social setting, sir. It's a clinical study done in the social setting, I must say. So it is some it is somewhat related to physiotherapy. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you can see the similarities, mm -hmm. but the intervention and the target is different. Sir. Ah. Yeah. It's so only... you 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 expect the physiological as well as psychological cognitive change also during the process. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we asked so many questions from presenters. Uh, questions? So we, yes, Dr. Tamara. Is it at the same workplace uh, that you, uh, the COSA Experiment Control Group was also there? Or how did you manage to do, get the uh, yeah, yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Very tricky. Uh, so yeah, the same place, 
we actually we carefully selected the people uh, and we thought of the contamination issue also right i think you are targeting the question is that so and uh, because the, these people are coming from uh, their homes right their own houses so uh, the the when we select the people especially we um, thought of uh, to very uh, to limit the contamination we we, we we got the precautions right and the they are work work schedules are different and then and and of course they have very limited uh, Whom to mix up? So if they are coming from us, uh, the boarding houses or something, then there can be uh, some contamination issue. Issue, but uh, this was very limited, and this scattered everywhere <clears throat> in all uh, eight uh, respective places. So uh, there can be, but it is very limited. Chances are very remote, madam. Uh, the final comment: uh, all these five stud five studies, uh, I believe, uh, within the context of digitalization they all have produced uh, several uh, uh, digital output and i believe uh, it will uh, be something like achieving resilience so we wish you all the best for your future research and we congratulate you all your hard work and uh, we expect uh, you to be uh, next present next conference as well and thank you very much on behalf of the organizing committee thank you thank you very much sir that was such a fruitful session that we can get valuable insights to apply to our further research studies and expand our knowledge now we would like to invite the chair professor piedad sahevage accompanied by Dr. Tamara Jayasundara to award the certificates to the presenters. V.M. Fernando. M.P.M. Valapoda. P. Senuviratna. MHR Sandeepani P. Jayatilaka We would like to thank the presenters on behalf of gathering here for the valuable knowledge that they have provided us. Sir, please remain to receive the token of appreciation. We would like to invite Mr. Kitsri Amaratunga, the Dean, Faculty of Management, Social Sciences and Humanities of the University, accompanied by Dr. Tamar Jayasundara, Head of the Department of Social Sciences, to award the token of appreciation. Thank you, sir. That was such a scholarly session on almost all the sessions that we are studying so far. All these valuable insights gave us a new perspective that one should adapt while discussing these issues practically. We invite the invitees and the presenters to the cafeteria for refreshments. With that, we conclude the second parallel technical session of social sciences. And this is the end of the 16th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kozalavala Defense University in 2023.